Please turn with me in your Bible to the Gospel of John, chapter 20, right at the end of John's Gospel, John chapter 20. Just to remind everyone, and maybe for those who are visiting, we went through the first half of the book of Exodus over the last several months, and we are leaving Exodus for the time being, and we're heading towards uh, 1 Corinthians, and we'll be working through 1 Corinthians 12 to 16, Lord willing, uh, all the way up and through Easter. And in between those two uh, expository series, as we work through a book of the Bible verse by verse, we're doing a few topical sermons. So last Sunday we talked about Uh, why we we believe in believer's baptism as a Baptist church, and we went through a series of arguments for that. Uh, Next Sunday, to prepare ourselves for 1 Corinthians, if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians 12 to 16, it has to do with those uh, some more controversial issues, which involve the topic of New Testament prophecy and tongues and interpretation of tongues and miracles and healings. And so, Lord willing, next Sunday we're going to do a largely topical sermon on New Testament prophecy, and then we'll move our way through 1 Corinthians 12 to 16. That leaves us today also dealing with some major church issues. And today we are talking about authority in the local church. Authority in the local church. And this may seem like, you know, of all the things we could talk about for the, for the next series of minutes, is this really that significant? Why, why do we need to spend time talking about authority in the local church? I'm going to go ahead and tell you my conclusion at the beginning, and then I will try my best to argue for the conclusion. So, as far as our church goes, there there are kind of two ways that um, a church like ours could be structured, two extreme ways that a church could be structured regarding authority. Number one, you could have a pure democracy, in which case every single decision that the church makes about anything from the color of the carpet to anything else, whether we bring on a new staff member and anything in between, Every single decision has to be taken to congregational vote, and it's really a pure democracy, and there can be an open mic, and maybe you've been in the room for some of these not-so-great moments where angry members are yelling at a pastor, or maybe a pastor's reprimanding the congregation, and people are back and forth at each other's throats. We don't have to raise hands, but you know what I'm talking about. Those are not fun meetings, and I think some of us have been in the room for some of those. So that's one extreme view is pure democracy, which is not what we believe here as a church. The other view, which is pretty far to the other side, is what I'm going to call pure elder rule. And that's what our church has been for the past four years since we started. We've been really pure elder rule. And what that means is essentially every decision made by the church, whether it's large or small, uh, goes through the elders. And the congregation, while the congregation can give input and the congregation can speak to the elders in private, the congregation did not have a place in the church where they could formally contribute to any kind of decision making at all. And so, this is, I mean, a relatively significant Sunday because it's a, it's a slight transition for our church government structure, and I want to try to explain what we would like to change. It's not going to be a dramatic change, but it is a, it is a significant change, and what, we would, what we're going to be shifting is something that has been called, you ready for the title? This is not very gripping, Plural Elder-Led Congregationalism, ladies and gentlemen. Aren't you excited? So, plural, plural elder-led congregationalism. Well, what, what do we mean by that? And what I have in the elders as we've discussed these things, over the last several years, increasingly, we have become persuaded, but we, we wanted to move slowly and carefully on this. We didn't want to jump ahead of our convictions and, and be incorrect on this, but we, we become increasingly persuaded that there are two issues that are at tension in the New Testament, and that's what we're going to look at today, is on the one side, you do have elder rule taught in the New Testament. So, members are called to submit to the leadership of their elders, and we'll look at some verses on that. So there's elder rule and and membership called to support the leadership of the elders. At the same time, I'm going to argue that on major decisions for the church, including, I'll, I'll mention four categories that we're thinking of, bringing in new members into the church, excommunicating unrepentant sinning members from the church, adding or removing uh, elders from the church, and then number four, we, we're also just as a, this is, there's no Bible verse on this fourth one, but uh, we're thinking the annual budget would be included as well as, as issues to be voted on by the entire membership of our church. And I'm going to try to explain where we're getting that from and explain the tension between these two ideas, which I think instead of taking one extreme, elder rule only, 
or the other extreme, vote on every single decision, which is a pure democracy. I think the Bible teaches something, uh, a third option, essentially, in the middle. So, we're going to start perhaps in an unusual place. This is um, John 20, verse 19, and I'm going to go ahead and read it, and I'll talk briefly. We're going to march through a number of passages here. John 20, verse 19. On the evening of that day, this is uh, resurrection, uh, this is Sunday evening, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, I don't think this is the actual moment that the Holy Spirit was given literally. I think that comes about 40 days later or so on, at Pentecost. I think Jesus is giving a sneak preview, a symbolic preview. So He breathes on them. This is the same kind of language used of God in Genesis 2. He breathed into Adam the breath of life, and now the life-giving Spirit is going to be breathed on the disciples, and the church will be born at Pentecost on, in Acts 2. Spirit comes down, and then the new church begins. But what's really tricky is verse 23. Let me read it again. Jesus says to the apostles, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Isn't that a little puzzling, right? Does this mean that the apostles just can arbitrarily decide who is forgiven and who is not forgiven? Well, no, that's not what's going on here. And what we'll see in coming passages is this. Jesus is giving them an authority based on His Word and His gospel and His Spirit to declare what is already true in heaven on earth. In other words, to declare on earth what is already true in heaven. In other words, they are given the gospel so that they can know when someone repents of sin and puts their faith in Jesus, and someone gives a public profession of faith and has a credible transformation of life, they have heaven's authority to declare that person forgiven, not because they have magical powers, but because they have the true gospel and can accord with heaven's teaching. So when the apostles say at Pentecost, 3,000 were converted and added to the church, they are making an accurate statement, but they're not making those people Christians. Do you see? They're just declaring what is true in heaven. So as they declare sin forgiven, heaven agrees and it is forgiven. And if they declare sin is left unforgiven, if someone rejects the gospel, they have every right to say, your sin is not yet forgiven. The gospel is still available, but because you re re refuse Jesus, your sins are not yet forgiven. So it's declarative authority. It, it is having the authority on earth to declare what God has revealed about what is true in heaven. Now, let's flip backwards to Matthew's gospel, and I want to spend some time in Matthew 16. As you are turning to Matthew 16, I'll just mention this as well. God has given the church a certain kind of authority, and I believe Jesus calls this authority the authority of the keys of the kingdom. A controversial passage. The authority of the keys are given to the church, and God gives, for instance, the government a different kind of authority, the authority of the sword in Romans 13. So that the government is called by their authority to punish criminals and wrongdoers. The church does not have that kind of authority. The, the church has the authority of the keys of the kingdom, which we're going to look at right here. So Matthew 16, this is a turning point in Matthew's gospel, a very big moment of transition. Matthew 16, look at verse 13. In the midst of Jesus' ministry, this is what happens. Matthew 16, 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, who do people say that, I, that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. 
And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Okay. Now, this is a controversial passage. I don't, I don't claim to know everything about all that's happening here. But I do think I know some things that are happening here, and that's what I want to discuss. So, so look with me again at verse 16. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Um, is Jesus looking at someone, in this case Peter, and is Jesus testing his knowledge of the gospel? Is he testing his basic knowledge of who I am? Who is Jesus? Who, who am I? And does Peter give the right answer, at least at this moment? He will put his foot in his mouth in about three verses. But right now, Peter's got it right. This is like, Peter's like, I got, I got an answer right, Lord? Yes, yes, Peter, this time, for once, you got an answer correct. In about three verses, I'm going to call you, I'm going to say, get behind me, Satan. But before we get to that, you got this part right. So Peter actually gets the right answer, and he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So is Jesus putting him through the test of, do you have a basic knowledge of who Christ is? Yeah, who Jesus is? He gets it right. You are the Christ, the Son of God. And does Jesus also give, um, uh, what's the word here, credibility to Peter as a person? Does he say, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build the church? Yes, and you may know the word, I think it's the word Petros is the word for Peter, and the word Petra is the word for rock. I think I got that right. And so it's a word play. You are Peter the rock, and on this rock I will build my church. And... Uh, I know this passage has been used by the Catholic Church to argue that Peter was the first pope and that the church was built on Peter as the first pope, and then all the popes were in succession from Peter. Um, let me just add, if Peter is the first pope, then moments later Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, after something Peter says. I just want to wonder how that factors in <laughs> to his incredible ability to speak uh, infallible truth. But if, anyways, neither here nor there on that. I don't think this is a, uh, saying that Peter is, is the pope. I think that it's just simply stating what the entire New Testament says. Uh, it says that the, the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. This is not a controversial thing for us as Protestants. We know that Christ picked 12, and he gave them his word and his spirit in a special way to speak the authoritative, infallible, and inerrant words of God. And it is true that Christ is the cornerstone, but the apostles are foundation stones of the church that is built on the truth they proclaim. This is not anything about the, the papacy. is nothing here at all that I see. This is simply an obvious statement here that the apostolic truth that they were to speak would be foundation stones of the church that we learn from and read and, and, are, and are built up on. But you see here, Jesus is testing both what He believes, and He's also speaking about who He is. Who do you say that I am? And He gives the right answer. You are Peter, and He talks about what kind of man He is. You've got these two things here. What do you believe, and who are you? And it seems like those tests are the kind of tests that are given to, to us to do. So look again, verse 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Uh, that is not actually the word hell, literally, it, it is the word Hades, and I, I think here, uh, a lot of people think this, that that simply means that the gates of Hades, I believe, are just a reference to the grave. Uh, the gates of death and the gates of Sheol in the Old Testament are spoken of many times, the gates of Hades, and it's just a place where the dead go when they die, and I think it's saying here that if a, you're a believer in Jesus… And whether you're martyred or you die naturally, the grave does not get the last word on the church of Jesus Christ. The gates of Hades, that is the grave, the gates of death, will not hold back the church because one day resurrection is coming and the gates will be kicked open and there will be resurrection for God's people. So do not think that death will destroy God's people because Jesus has overcome the gates of Hades. Now, I could be wrong on that. That's a debated passage, but I do think that is likely what is going on there. But look at verses 19, uh, verse 19. This is important for our discussion today. Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Do you see here a possible similarity to the John 20 passage? So that what they are declaring with the keys of the kingdom on earth is reflective of what is true in heaven. Binding and loosing. What, what, what does that mean? What, what does this binding and loosing mean? What, what is that about? Well, turn with me to Matthew 18, just two chapters to the right. Matthew 
the reason why I put these two texts together is multiple reasons, but number one, Jesus only uses the word church in two verses in the New Testament, and we're going to look at both of them. Matthew 16 and Matthew 18 are the only two places Jesus speaks explicitly of the church, and let's, let's look at this passage about church discipline and see if we can get some light shed on what this binding and loosing and the, this idea of the keys might be referring to. Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the what? The church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Now, do you see verse uh, 18? Let me read it one more time. After speaking of removing the unrepentant person from the church, Jesus says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Do you see here that binding seems to represent withholding God's forgiveness, and that loosing seems to be releasing, letting go of the sin, forgiving, declaring forgiveness? Okay. Here's what's significant. In John 20, Jesus is talking to the twelve apostles. In Matthew 16, he's talking to Peter and the apostles. But here, the keys of the kingdom, the binding and loosing, the declaring forgiven and not forgiven is not left with with only the apostles or the papacy. Where, Where is it given? It's given to the entire church. And this is very significant for us as elders on why we are shifting on this point as a church. Because what we're seeing here is when it comes, to, so if, if just, I know we've talked about church discipline in the past, so we don't need to repeat all of it, but just to remind you. If there is a person in our church who says someone was um, c- committing an obvious outward sin that was just willful and clear, first, the person who sees it should go one-on-one and speak to that person and try to win them back from their pattern of sin. If the person does not listen to the one-on-one conversation, then that one person should go find one or two others. So now there's two or three, an Old Testament principle to have two or three witnesses, and then they go confront the person. If the person refuses to listen to the three or the two, it does not say, take it to the elders. Do you see? See, in our church government, essentially, the elders would make the final decision. So you would take it to the elders, and the elders would then declare bound or loosed. This person is living in unrepentant sin or not, and the the elders would have all the authority to bind or loose, to have the keys of the kingdom, to either declare the person in or out, to declare the person, as far as we can see, forgiven or not forgiven. But I cannot get away from these words here. The last court of appeal in the local church, according to Jesus, is not the elders of the church, which is how we've done this, but the final court of appeal on matters of church membership and church excommunication is the entire body of membership. Now, by the way, doesn't this mean membership really, really, really matters? Because the authority of the keys is not just given to Peter. You know all those jokes about Peter at heaven's gates, letting people in? That's where that comes from. It's a misunderstanding of Matthew 16, that he's got the keys by himself, and he unlocks or closes the door. No, the keys are not left with Peter. They're not even left with the 12. Here Jesus says, whatever you, referring to any church, any local church, whatever you bind is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose is loosed in heaven. So Jesus is saying that the keys of the kingdom are given to the gathered congregation of any gospel-teaching, faithful local church. Now, that is a staggering level of authority and a staggering thing to say about the membership. And one of the side effects I think this will have on our church, I pray that it will have, is this. For lack of a better word, now everybody's got skin in the game. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Like now, instead of just sort of sitting back and saying, well, you know, I think the elders will make the final call and we can just sort of, you know, entrust it to them and and, and just kind of, you know, trust them with it and pray well, that's true. Absolutely. Trust, uh, trust in the Lord. Pray. But this means now the responsibility for new members joining, for members being removed if that ever has to happen, and for other such things as that rests with every member of our church, which means 
we need to all lean in and embrace the responsibility, this job, this wonderful job, this high responsibility that the Lord has given to the whole church. Tell it to the church, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Turn with me to the right to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to show you that this is not confined to only one or two passages. 1 Corinthians 5 has had a huge effect on this decision. And again, we've preached on this text before, so I'm not going to explain all of it, but I want to explain the parts that are relevant for us. So this is, again, one of the clearest sections in the Bible on church discipline, but look what we learn about the authority in this situation. So this is 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. That's excommunication, verse 3. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. So, Paul has passed judgment. Verse 4, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, do you get the scene here? This is, this is a Sunday gathering. When you are assembled, the whole church together, all of its members, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and then Paul says, in my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. I, 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 don't, I don't like getting into technical translation issues, but I just have to mention, uh, some of you probably have the New American Standard in your lap right now, which is a great translation. It's one of the best translations out there. But I have a slight quibble with the translation of the NAS on verse 5. Um, there, there's a lack of a couple words in the Greek. The words you are in ESV, you are to deliver this one over. The you are are not provided in the original language, so every translator has to supply their own words. And the NAS and about two other English translations that I saw, I looked at about 29 or 30 English translations, about two or three of them uh, translated here that Paul was the one delivering the man over. So the about three English translations out of 29 or 30 think Paul's the one handing him over, and the other 26 English translations think, no, the Corinthians are being commanded to hand the man over. You see how that does make a difference. So, I don't want to rest my argument on words that are not in the Greek, right? <laughs> so, I'm not going to rest my argument on verse 5. I think it's clear from the rest of the text that Paul is commanding the church to do this, not, not just something that Paul himself has, has uh, taken a position on. So, look with me at verse 6, and I'll try to show you where he's commanding the church to do this. Verse 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Look at the command, verse 7. Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Who is being commanded to cleanse out the old lump? It's the gathered assembly. It's the church at Corinth. Okay, verse uh, 8, let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, uh, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And then look at verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter, not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or, and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world, but I am writing to you not to associate. So, clearly, he's commanding now, you see, the whole church. I'm, I, I wrote to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, that is, claims to be a Christian, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, and then he commands them again, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? I think again, commanding the church. Verse 13, God judges those outside, and then here's the last command, purge the evil person from among you. Who is Paul telling to purge the evil person from among them? It's not, he's, he's not commanding himself to do it. He's commanding the, the church at Corinth. So, I think it's safe to argue here 
that Paul says when the church gathers together, when you are all assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, you are to carry out what Paul is asking. Paul cannot excommunicate the man independently. The church gathered corporately has to hand the man over, has to, has to turn the man over so that they are responsible ultimately for the issue of excommunication. Now, if that isn't clear enough yet, I want to show you another one that I think is even clearer. 2 Corinthians, let's go to the next book of the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I think this may be the clearest of all the passages, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And before I forget to mention this, I just say this now as you're turning there, next Sunday night, Lord willing, we have our church meal. And during that meal, uh, we're going to go into a little more detail on a panel about some of the specifics of what this will look like for us as a church, that I, I can't cover all of that right now. But so just remember, next Sunday during the meal, we'll, we'll try to cover some of the specifics in a little more detail of what this might look like for us. But look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We don't know if he's talking about the same guy from, chapter, from 1 Corinthians who was removed from the church or another person, but frankly, it doesn't make a lot of difference for what we're trying to see. So 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5 This is just fascinating to me. So, look at verse 5. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to who? To all of you. So, he's talking about the whole church. Verse 6, for such a one, this punishment by who? The majority is enough that's excommunication. This guy, was, this guy was excommunicated by majority vote, verse 7. So, you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So, I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. Now, do you see it there? I think that's really strong. So, Paul, Paul doesn't say, I excommunicate him, I bring him back in, I'm an apostle. That's not what Paul says. Paul instead instructs the church what to do in this matter. So, let me set the scene again. There is a man. We don't know if it's the same guy or not from the first letter. There's a guy who had already been removed from the church. How was he removed? It was by the majority. The punishment inflicted by the majority is sufficient. It's enough. In other words, this man was was removed from the church by the majority of the members, which has to imply, doesn't it, some kind of vote? I mean, to get a majority, how do you know if there's a majority unless there's a vote? And so, in order to get a majority, the, the many, the greater number, in order to get that, there has to be a congregational vote of some kind. You have to know where people stand, and it sounds like, well, not doesn't sound like, it says, the majority of the members agreed that this man should be removed from membership, and he was, and now Paul says he has now shown sufficient repentance. His excommunication showed him how much he was in sin. He repented. He regretted it. He was remorseful. He showed real repentance, and now he wants to be let back into the church. And Paul says, you should let him back in. Let me just reread the whole part here just to see if it's clear. So, 2.5 again. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely to all of you. So, Paul's talking about the whole church. Verse 6. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough, so you, the church, should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow, so I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. Do you see it there? The keys of the kingdom, binding and loosing, declaring sins forgiven or not forgiven, The majority had said, this man right now is not walking in truth with the gospel. He must be removed to protect the reputation of the church, to protect his sin from infecting others in the church, and to wake him up to the serious nature of unrepentant sin, which if not dealt with will lead away from Christ into a Christless eternity. And so they do what what, what is commanded. They, by a majority vote, they hand him over. They, they turn him away from membership, and they say, we don't see any reason to believe that your profession in, in Christ is, is credible, is legitimate. 
And this man wakes up in his, in his sin out there outside the church. He is awakened by the seriousness of church discipline. He, he is awakened to how serious his state is. He sees his need of repentance. He does repent. And Paul says, okay, I want the church now to come around and embrace him. Re, re-embrace him. Welcome him back in and to reaffirm your love for him and express turning and forgiveness and comforting so that he's not overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So here, here's my point. Not only is excommunication done by majority vote, but isn't bringing on a new member, in this case, they're bringing this guy back into membership, isn't it done by the majority? Yeah. So just as the majority voted to remove the man, now the, the, now the church is being called to re-embrace and, and reaffirm their love. In other words, bring him back into membership. So I think here again, you see the keys of the kingdom being given not to an elite few up at the top, um, not to a bishop or a pope, but given to the whole church, and the church is responsible by how they collectively respond to this man who is now repentant and wanting to come back in. Now, look what Paul adds on here. Look at verse 9. For this is why I wrote that I might test you to know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes, his designs. How many of y'all, y'all have heard that verse, right? That don't be un- outwitted by Satan's designs? How many of us realized that Satan's schemes had to do with not properly understanding how the congregation is interacting with church discipline and bringing on new members? Paul says, because you don't understand properly when and how to excommunicate and bring a new member on as a majority, being ignorant of how to do that properly is being tricked by the schemes of Satan. Because this guy, if, we didn't, if they did not do church discipline correctly, this man who was genuinely repentant would have been left outside the church when he actually deserved to come back in, when he actually showed fruit. And when they were going to leave him out longer than they should have, he would have been overwhelmed by excessive sorrow and perhaps would have fallen away further. And so Paul says, correctly understanding, bringing on new members, and, and in this case, excommunicating sinning members, unrepentant sinning members, not doing that in a biblical way is being tricked by Satan's schemes. And we don't want to be tricked by Satan's schemes, so we want to have a biblical understanding of church authority. Turn with me to the right to Galatians chapter 1, the very next book over. Galatians chapter 1. And it's interesting as you turn there, and I am not saying elders don't matter, we'll get to that in a moment, but in the letters of First and Second Corinthians… Do you know how many times the elders are referred to? Zero times. Paul talks to the congregation over and over and over, not a single mention of the elders of the church, strangely enough, in First and Second Corinthians. Look at Galatians chapter 1, when a false teacher comes in preaching a false gospel, Paul says in verse 6, I am astonished that you, referring to the whole church, are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Now, do you see here, is Paul actually, he's not talking to the pastors. He's talking to the whole church at Galatia, and he says, you guys should have known the gospel well enough to recognize a false gospel, and you should have sent the false teachers running out the door. You should not have embraced them and begun to believe a distorted gospel. So here again, Paul calls the whole congregation to account by, for, because they were starting to believe a false gospel. Turn with me to the right again to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Peter, I mean, excuse me, Paul, again, is telling Peter to preach the Word, but look at what he says about the the people as well. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from the truth excuse me, will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. 
For those who were here yesterday when we watched American Gospel, you saw what uh, the kind of teaching is that tells people what they want to hear, the, the prosperity theology that we looked at yesterday. And here again, Paul does not just blame the teachers. Of course, Paul blames the teachers. Teachers will be dr- judged more strictly. That is, that is true and a, and a sobering thought. But Paul also blames the people who accumulate for themselves false teachers. It's not just the false teacher's fault. They bear the primary responsibility, but it's also the people's fault when they gather around themselves people who will teach them what they want to hear, not necessarily what Scripture teaches. And so on we could go. I, I wanna, I'm just pointing out passages where the congregation is responsible for the kind of teaching that is, that is believed and, and the kind of things that they listen to as well. Turn backwards one book to 1 Timothy 5. We're going to be flipping just a few more times here before the end. So just uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, and we won't read through the whole text. Just look at verse 17. 1 Timothy 5, 17. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of do- double honor, especially those who labor in teaching and preaching. But look at that first part. Let the elders who rule well. So do you see here, we definitely have elder authority in that verse. Flip with me again to the right a few books to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, the last chapter of Hebrews. This is a well-known verse on church uh, structure here, Hebrews 13, verse 17. The author writes, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So, do you see here the tension that I'm trying to under, that we're trying to understand here? Is on one side, you have elders called to rule the church. Uh, members of the church are called to submit to their leaders and to, to make their work a joy and to support their leadership and to be, to be supportive in all appropriate ways. That's one side. And then you've got the keys and the binding and loosing given to the entire congregation. Now, do you see the tension here? So, who's Where's the authority in the church? Who has the authority? Is it the elders? Is it the congregation as a whole? And the answer is, it's a both and, but let me try to give some important caveats. To the best we can tell, when it comes to the day in, day out, weekly management of the church on just the mundane, regular issues, those things are given to the leaders of the church. That's the whole point. It it, it just frankly is chaotic to try to vote on everything, and that's not what the New Testament is teaching. So, God has called elders a plurality of elders, to lead the local church. And when they do that, the the regular week-to-week tasks of the church are in the hands of the elders, and they're just called to make a lot of decisions that are wisdom calls, where there might not be a verse that says exactly how to do something one way or another. The elders are called to make wisdom decisions, to pray together, to to be accountable to each other, and to try to lead the church through many different things. So just for instance, the the mini-conference on Saturday. That would not be something that we would take a vote on, should we have a mini-conference on Saturday or something. That's something that the elders, we try to make a decision that we think is wise on timing and different things, and we make a call on things like that. So when it comes to just sort of the regular uh, week-to-week business of the church, the elders are called to lead, and members are called to joyfully uh, support the leadership of the elders. But I am just increasingly persuaded that when it comes to the major issues of the church, bringing on new members removing unrepentant members, uh, establishing uh, or removing elders, and uh, we would consider our annual budget as well to be under this umbrella when it comes to those major issues of the church. We believe that the final court of appeal is the assembled body of Christ together and taking a vote on those major decisions. Uh, Mark Dever, some of you may know who that is, a pastor in Washington, D.C. He has a church that's formatted in the same kind of way. And Mark Dever has said, think of it like this. Think of the elders as the steering wheel, okay, of the church. Imagine we're driving down the road. The elders have the steering wheel. And so when it comes to the regular leadership of the church, the elders are called to steer the the church in the way that they should go. But he said the congregational vote is to function much more like an emergency break. And this is what he means by that. He said, uh, according to the New Testament, in all matters where the elders are being biblical, the church is called to support their leadership. So, for instance, if we had, uh, let's say we had one new member joining, and we would have then, as elders, we would have read their testimony, we would have seen their understanding of the gospel. We would have met with them uh, after a church service and gotten to know them. We would have spent some time with them, and after a period of time, the elders would say, okay, based on what Scripture says, 
We cannot read the heart. But based on what Scripture says, this person understands the gospel and can articulate who is Jesus, like Peter did, and this person shows a credible profession of faith. We don't know of unrepentant, obvious sin in their life. They seem to have fruit. They seem to be hungry for the Lord. And so after that period of testing, we believe that they pass the approval of Scripture to join our church. And then uh, in a members meeting, we would say to all the members of the church, we believe on the authority of Scripture that this person has every reason to be added to our church. And if a member knew something that was critically important to, to this decision, like maybe there was something secret that we didn't know about, that should be brought in private to the elders to, to, to let us know. But then when the final vote comes, the members of the church would hear the testimony of the person, just like we had heard. They would see some credible profession of faith, and then they, the members would be called to vote with the, with the leadership of the elders on that decision unless the elders were making a clearly unbiblical decision. Do you see what I mean there? So if we were going to bring on someone who denied the Trinity, and we were going to say, okay, this person loves the Lord, at least one of the members of the Trinity, they love part of the Lord. Uh, yeah, they love, they love the Father. They don't really, they're not really sure what they think about the Son. They don't really believe in the Trinity, but they believe in God the Father, and so we're going to let them join. Well, then now the emergency break needs to kick in. That's where, it, that's where the congregation as a whole needs to say, wait a second. We, we cannot have someone who doesn't believe the basics of the truth of Christianity joining our church. That's not right. So the emergency break would then be pulled, and the vote would come in you guys have lost your mind. That's how, that's how the vote would come in. What are y'all thinking? So you see, I hope, kind of what we're saying here. I don't think there will be a dramatic change to the day, day in, day out uh, government of our church. I think things will feel very much similar to how they've been. But I want you to know that when it comes to the final court of appeal, that will rest with the assembled church, as Jesus said, take it to the church and then see the church's final call and the church's final decision. All right, I've got one last passage. Turn with me back to Matthew 18, where we were a few minutes ago. Matthew chapter 18. And I want to add two more pieces of application for members of our church. And these two pieces of application fall on either side of the church discipline text that we already read. So I won't reread that. I want to read the part just before and just after because I am convinced they all go together. So look with me back in Matthew 18, verse 12. Just before Jesus says, if your brother sins, go to him, he tells this story. Matthew 18, verse 12. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not my will, is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Do you see how that flows together quite nicely? So here's what's going on here, I, I, I think. You've got a hundred sheep. Our church is close to that, right? A hundred sheep. And if one wanders away, that's great that 99 did not wander. But if we love our people, it is our, I don't mean the elders, I mean all of our. If you're a member of this church, this is on you as much as it's on anybody. It is our responsibility if someone is wandering away from the fold for us to not self-righteously run after them and condemn them, for us to lovingly, relationally pursue that person and, and, and try to bring them back into the fold. So this is a responsibility that rests on all of us. If, if out of the hundred sheep, if one is wandering off, the heart of the Father is for the one. Yes, it's great that 99 are still here. They're, they're, they're faithful. They, they love the Lord. But if one is beginning to wander, in whatever way that might mean, Jesus then says, if your brother sins, go to him. If, you're, if the sheep is wandering, go find the sheep. So I want our church to be marked not by self-righteous, legalistic, you know, one, you know pointing out error, I want it to be a heart of compassion and love that relationally pursues those who are drifting, for those who are, who, are, who are astray, that we would win them back by relationship, that we would win them back to the fold, and that is a responsibility for all of us. All right, and the second one, I'll just read it, and, and then it will, we'll come to a conclusion. Uh, verse 21, right after Jesus has talked about bringing people back into the fold if they repent, Peter, <laughs> oh man. You got to love Peter. 1821, then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often 
Will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? <laughs> Man, I love Peter. So Peter hears, okay, you're telling me that if, if someone wanders away and then you go off and you win them back and they, they repent and they come back into the fold, how many times do we have to do that? Like, it's seven, like I'll even, Lord, I'll do it seven times. That's pretty, like, can you believe, I'd, I'd forgive someone, if someone wandered seven different times over the course of a few years, and if I, I I'd forgive them up to seven, it's a perfect number, Lord, seven times. And the Lord's like, Peter, how many times have I forgiven you? Um, that's my paraphrase. Uh, verse verse uh, 22, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king, I love this story, who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Now, just pause here. If you're not a believer today, I want you to know we, we are thrilled that you are here. I know this has been sort of an in-house discussion about church membership, and maybe you feel like, well, what does this have to do with me? I want to say this. The king who is represented in this story is the God who made heaven and earth. And this is bad news, but I promise you there's about to be some good news. Here, here's the bad news for all of us. There is coming a day where the Lord of heaven the king of kings, is going to settle accounts with all of his people. Everybody who he's ever made. Not just his people, but all people. He's going to settle accounts. And what that means in this story is that if we owe a debt to God by our sin, we're going to be required to make good on that debt and to pay that debt. And the point of this story is we don't want to be the one who pays the debt. We want a debt that is forgiven by grace. So look with me here. Verse 24. When he, the king, began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. That is an unimaginable amount of money in that time. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He released him and forgave the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, a much smaller amount of money. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place, then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers, until he should pay all his debt. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. So two things. Number one, if you're not a believer, there is coming a day where the Lord is going to settle accounts with all. And if you are left having to pay your own debt, it will be like this man stuck in prison trying to pay off a billion dollars. It's never going to happen. You will never be able to pay off your sins on your own. But if you plead with mercy to the king and you beg the blood of Jesus over your life, the Lord will graciously forgive the worst of sin and cancel your debt of a billion dollars. It will vanish because of the work of Christ. Then secondly, if you are a believer and someone in our church sins, and let's say even sins seriously against you personally or against perhaps the whole body, after going through the proper steps here, if that person is repentant, and that person hates what they did wrong, and they want to be re-embraced by the community, it is our obligation because of Christ forgiving us that we forgive that person 77 times, 70 times, 7 times. There is a limitless number of times. If a person is truly penitent, repenting of sin, we never reach a point because we've been forgiven of so much more. We never reach a point where we say, you've sinned too much. No matter what repentance you show, we're never letting you back in. That is not the way Christ would have us response. No. If someone is genuinely penitent and broken over their sin, we always receive them back with open arms, knowing that we have been forgiven the greater debt with our Heavenly Father. Let's pray together.
Heavenly Father, thank you for the way this church already in different ways has come together, its members to embrace others. Lord, thank you for the forgiveness that we've seen modeled in this church. Well, I could just think of so many ways I personally have sinned against people in this church. Failing to pray, getting irritable, not responding as I should. I could just think of many ways where I in the last four years have sinned against people in this room. And Lord, you have worked such a work of grace in the lives of the people here that I have received nothing but kindness and forgiveness in response to my many failings. And Lord, we are thankful for a gospel of forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with a holy God through the work of your sinless Son who stood in our place on the cross. Lord, I pray that our church would be marked not by pretentiousness, not by legalistic condemnation of others for any small error. I pray that our church would be known for graciousness and love. Help us to lovingly and graciously and relationally pursue the wanderer and win them back to the fold. Help us to show that the gospel of our forgiveness is true by the way that we forgive and love each other. Lord, we are an imperfect church, and there's not one of us in this room who has perfectly lived in agreement with everyone else who is here. Lord, we need your forgiveness, and I thank you, Lord, for the gracious work you've done in so many to give us a love and a reconciliation and an ability to forgive one another from the heart because of the work of your Spirit in our lives. Lord, we are not perfect, but we want to become more like Jesus. And I pray as we step into this slightly new view of our church government structure that you would help our church to be more fruitful than ever, more God-honoring than ever, and more Christ-like than we've ever been so far. Lord, thank you for your people and the blessing they are to us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.